We are very pleased to have Dr. William Bennett with us this evening. Dr. Bennett is one of America's most important, influential, and respected voices on cultural, political, and education issues. As someone who read Dr. Bennett's Book of Virtues to his kids 20 years ago, I feel deeply honored to have the opportunity to introduce him to you tonight. Like all of you Eagle Scouts out there, he is someone who walks through life with integrity and with purpose. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Bennett studied philosophy at Williams College and the University of Texas and earned a law degree from Harvard. Dr. Bennett served as Secretary of Education under President Ronald Reagan and was the nation's first drug czar under President George H.W. Bush. Dr. Bennett has written or co-authored more than 25 books, including two New York Times number one bestsellers, one of them being The Book of Virtues, one of the most successful books of the 1990s. Although he is a well-known Republican, Dr. Bennett has often crossed party lines in order to pursue important common purposes. Dr. Bennett was a scout growing up, and his two sons were in scouting. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. William J. Bennett. Thank you, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Scouts, Scouts Emeritus, good evening all. Just to build my confidence, <clears throat> my lifelong partner, my wife of 36 years, was giggling just as I was being introduced, saying, it was very wise to get the pledge cards out before you spoke in case people, <clears throat> in case people don't like what you have to say. All right, <clears throat> fair enough. Uh, I am uh, humbled to be here. Yeah, I, I was a scout, uh, sort of. Um, I uh, was in the presence of this room. I, I thought Eagle Scouts were 4% of all scouts. There are all of them in the country in this room tonight? <laughs> Extraordinary, uh, and I am uh, humbled by it. I am a sinner in a hall of saints here. Um, I, the only thing I can think of that's analogous for me in my career is I was named by uh, colleagues in the Reagan administration the quarterback of government. So we went to the quarterback club dinner in Washington and um, I met in a line Joe Montana, uh, John Elway, and Bart Starr. And Starr said, you're a quarterback too. I said, yes, yes, I am. Yeah, yes, I am. So um, let, let's do that first. I uh, was a scout. Uh, full disclosure, uh, not much of one. Um, I was a Boy Scout in Brooklyn. That may help explain, or at least I would like to think it helps. Seemed to me the merit badges were stacked towards kids from Kansas or Wyoming or <laughs> Virginia. Um, outdoorsy stuff. Um, the outdoorsy stuff we did in Brooklyn didn't really qualify like hanging out at the corner, um, going up and down in a subway, uh, and um, other things. Uh, I worked a little bit at it, did the best I could, I'll tell you a story in a minute, but um, never really progressed too far. We uh, had an outing into what we were told was the woods. I remember I <coughs> packed my pack, took the subway uh, to the you know, the Dixie bus terminal in uh, Manhattan, got on the bus and rode a good hour and 10 minutes to the Catskills. We got off the side of the highway and the assistant uh, scoutmaster led us up the hill uh, where we got into a rainstorm. Uh, he wasn't, I hate to say this, much more skilled than we were. We all tried to build a fire and none of us could. And we walked back down the hill and went to Dairy Queen. Um, <laughs> 
see how poorly this started for me. And again, no merit badge for Dairy Queen. Um, as the father of sons who were in scouting, I have to say they at least had better assistance. They at least had a better guide. Uh, my life partner, Mrs. Bennett, uh, encouraged them into scouting. I did too, but she was the driving force. And I would like her to stand just to momentarily while I tell you her distinctions. <laughs> Curved bar. Curved Bar Gold Award, Akela, that's leader of a cub pack, for those of you a little older, I don't know if you still have Akela. Remember what great, uh, the, the noise that Akela would make occasionally? Does anybody remember? The grand howl. That's a howl that Akela made. I've heard that a few times in the course of 36 years of marriage. Uh, <laughs> directed at me. She was also the engineer, how she did it, I don't know, of two Pinewood Derby winning entries. This is... <laughs> aerodynamics, mechanics, everything that escaped me. In any case, it's not the first example of a man being saved by a woman uh, and his boys encouraged into scouting for the right uh, reasons. Um, by the way, I, I have to note being here in Richmond is a kind of perfect place for Elaine and I. Uh, she is originally from Orangeburg, South Carolina, then Charlotte, North Carolina. I am from Brooklyn, New York, so Richmond's kind of a nice middle point. We are a real mixed marriage. It's not race, it's geography, believe me. I looked for pasta and I got rice. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, I grew up, uh, you know, on certain things, and I remember hearing one of my sons, after 10 years of marriage, saying, Mama, can we have more cheese in our grits? That's when I knew I was a long way from Brooklyn. <laughs> but this lady helped make scouts and has helped make me for whatever uh, I have become. And I thank her. She does, uh, doesn't howl that much, but she does give advice. When I was Secretary of Education, before I uh, I made my pronouncements, Elaine said, go out on the road, teach school, uh, go into classrooms, um, talk to students, show respect for the art of teachers by teaching yourself. I said, Elaine, I am the Secretary of Education of the United States. I do not do retail, I do wholesale. <laughs> and she said, why don't you go find out what you're talking about first before you make pronouncements? I said, why should I be different from everybody else up here? Anyway, <laughs> she, the daughter of a businessman, sent me out, and so I went to 120 schools. I was in the Emma Conn Elementary School in Raleigh, North Carolina, talking to the third graders about George Washington. And I asked them whether it was a good thing or bad thing to grow old, and all the third graders said it was a bad thing to grow old. Didn't get one dissenting vote. Why? <clears throat> Why is it a bad thing to grow old? Well, you get, you get, you get grumpy and your bones get creaky, and you can't see, and you can't hear. And they're pretty tough. Eight, eight year olds are pretty tough. The filter's not in yet, you know? <clears throat> and uh, so that session was over. I told them a story about Washington. It was a story about how getting old uh, doesn't mean you get worse. It can mean, actually, you get better. Um, the story I told them, the story you can probably know, was about this great Virginian. Um, I, I, every time I'm in Virginia, I just have to tell Virginia stories. I was asked once, <clears throat> do you believe in state history or American history? I said, uh, both, unless you're in Virginia, then it's the same for the first 80 years. <laughs> Even though I'm a Yankee, I'll always take the side of those Virginia men from uh, some of those places against the Massachusetts people. Anyway, Washington, uh, his men wanted to march on Congress because they hadn't been paid. And Washington was trying to discourage them and he was not a great speaker. Uh, but he remembered a piece of paper, someone had written something and he put it in his pocket and he took it out and when he did, he put on his spectacles. And his men had never seen him in glasses before. And uh, he heard them intake a breath and he said, gentlemen, I see that 
you're surprised that I am putting on spectacles while I have grown not only gray but almost blind in the service of my country. And with that natural eloquence, uh, all opposition was, was over. I asked the kids again, it's a good thing or bad thing to grow old, and they paused and they said, well, you can get better some ways. Uh, in philosophy, we would call this the distinction between the moral good and the natural good. And um, there is a distinction. And uh, Washington just got better and better, as you know. Anyway, when it was over, I'm, I'm getting to my point. Mrs. Frankfurter used to say of Justice Frankfurter, Felix makes two mistakes when he speaks. First, he digresses from his text. Second, he returns to it. Um, <laughs> I'm returning to mine. Uh, and I said, any questions? A little boy raised his hand. He said, uh, when you get together with other people in the cupboard, and <clears throat> kids looked, a little girl sitting next to the little boy said, not cupboard, you dummy, cabinet, cabinet. <laughs> and the kid said cabinet. I said, before I go on, let me just tell you, young man, what just happened to you will be happening to you for the rest of your <laughs> life. My wife was rewriting this to the very last minute. Anyway, uh, but um, he said, when you get together with members of the cabinet, do you all really eat jelly bellies? And I said, you've heard about Ronald Reagan. Jelly beans, the president has jelly beans at cabinet meetings, covered meetings, passed them around. I've had a few. The little boy said, you've had more than a few, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> I said to the press in the back of the room, this is the sound of freedom. <clears throat> I said, you would not hear this in a Soviet classroom <clears throat> to the Soviet Minister of Education, but any kid in America can stand up to anybody. We've seen some of that the last few days, haven't we? Peter Wang, 15, junior ROTC member, Marjorie Douglas High School, Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, held the door open for students and faculty so they could escape. He was killed by that craven coward murderer. And this young man, Peter Wang's most fervent ambition was to be accepted to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. His wish was granted posthumously, again at age 15. This was a young man who listened and cared and was guided. Young people are capable of great things, we saw in that case and other cases cited tonight. They can also just be clanging cymbals and, and loud drums. The difference is often guidance, guidance at the hands of loving and caring adults. Junior ROTC offers that. So do the Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, that guiding hand, and now needed more than ever. A great change is in the culture. It doesn't get much attention, doesn't get much news, but it's very important. The late Democratic Senator from New York, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a great senator, and who introduced me for my three jobs in Washington, was asked on his retirement, what was the single most important change he saw in the world over his 40 years? And he said, all over the Atlantic, all over the West, Western Europe and the United States, is the decline of the family. It is a sea change which we have not yet comprehended its farthermost consequences. The decline of the family, not the disappearance, but the decline of the family. What is the family? I love a definition I heard once, can't remember who did it. He said, the family is the first, best, and original department of health, education, and welfare. Indeed it is, <clears throat> and it's not go governmental. And when it fails, or it doesn't do its job of health, education, welfare, others must step in. But before government steps in, others step in and can step in. And in the times in which we live, must step in. These are what Edmund Burke called those little platoons, the little platoons, those mediating institutions on whose back society rides and thrives. These little platoons raise children, 
maintain standards and maintain and even sometimes advance civilization. When families decline, greater pressure and greater need for organizations like these community groups, these mediating institutions, these scouts. It's a transfer of duty, not necessarily willingly, necessarily willingly, but it occurs. And the people you honored here tonight on stage accept that duty. And except for a brief moment, and the lights often work in anonymity. It was a heady academic sentence I heard, but I was an academic, did my PhD in philosophy, I wasn't thinking about future earnings. <laughs> Most of us PhDs are Uber drivers, it's all right. <laughs> Used to be cab drivers, it's getting better, anyway. But it was a heavy academic sentence that I first heard, but it's stayed with me ever since. It was the social philosopher Robert Nisbet. He said the conditions of success, or for success, for an individual or for society are pretty straightforward and simple. The forces of composition need to outweigh the forces of decomposition. Think of the lives of children. Think of the lives of children who were rescued from poverty, from bamboo huts, but also think of the children of the middle class and even of the affluent. How many live in situations or are self-imposed on their own lives, forces of decomposition in an amount greater than forces of composition? The scouts, are a force of composition. They always have been, they always will be. They foster community. They reveal as they encourage character. They give aspiration, support them. Two wonderful things uh, tonight <clears throat> uh, in the very beginning of the program. First uh, was the very moving, I never, fail to be moved by the singing of the Star Spangled Banner when it's done right. George Welch, I think that's the young man did it, did it right. Fergie, look out. <laughs> <laughs> the other was the words at the very beginning of the invocation. I don't know the young scout's name who gave the invocation. But I took this note. He said, in terms of the values of scouting, he talked about friendship, the encouragement of friendship. It's a thing we take very seriously in my family. I'm a student of Aristotle. I was visiting with my former colleague, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Richmond this afternoon, Kevin Cherry, who's written a book on Aristotle. And my wife runs a program, a marvelous program called Best Friends. And it's about what the true meaning of friendship is. Aristotle says there are three kinds of friends. We have friends for three reasons, all, all reasonable. The first kind of friend we have because that friend gives us pleasure, makes us laugh, it's fun, fun to be around. The second kind of friend we have because the friend is useful to us, does things for us, helps us, we work cooperatively. Maybe we build a campfire together. But the third kind of friendship, Aristotle says, and you can combine all three, is the most important and the one that we should all strive for. It's friendship in arete, in virtue. Friendship in excellence. And this is where one works with another and spends time with another to encourage the best realization of that other person's self. That is the best kind of friendship. Friendship that forms character and keeps it secure where, where friends can trust each other for a higher and best purpose. And that's what scouting is all about. It is a great force of composition. 
in a world, particularly world in which our young people live, where there are too many forces of decomposition coming at them. So I am honored to be your speaker tonight. I am done being your speaker tonight. <laughs> Please don't change the pledge card down. <laughs> and I thank you very much for the opportunity. Support scouting. It's never been needed more. Thank you very much.